Hello everyone, Mystic Games here, welcome back. This is going to be the real final episode of my Subnautica playthrough. Technically the playthrough is over. Um, we're going to be doing a PDA read of all the fauna and flora that we found. We're going to start with the tiger plant that is shooting me with m massive amounts of needles, as we can see. So I did put the PDA on freeze so that I will not drown or get hungry as fast. The tiger plant, which is seen here shooting projectiles, has adapted to anything within 15 meter meters and it can sense it and is capable of movements of its tubes as well as propelling of thorns at speeds of 10 ms. Although capable of incapacitating small herbivores as plant lacks carnivorous digestive organs, would-be predators caught in its defensive perimeter serve as a warning to other herbivores not to approach, and then as they decompose, they serve as fertilizer for the tiger plant. Avoid or incapacitate. I only planted one because I didn't want to have unnecessary problems. They can puncture your base. So I have my Seamoth here. I can't come much lower because he will start to break, but I'm using him as air. So let's start the floral. We're going to go with C. We have the bulb bush. Probably should have planted them in the ABC order, but I did not. This aquatic species has evolved to grow in deep sandy environments and conserve its hydration levels against relatively extreme external temperatures. The root system can fragment the shell rock it grows on to form a deep anchor point allowing predators to graze but not easily uproot the entire plant, which is interesting. The grazing will tend to dislodge parts of the plant and each section is capable of growing into a fully formed adult plant. Oh. So it intentionally allows itself to get eaten so it can spread. That's interesting. So then we have Gabe's Feather. This plant grows almost exclusively in deep waters where its hand-like leaves have evolved to filter sediment from the environment. It is likely dependent on excretions of fauna populating the waters above and around it. We then have the Spiked Horn and the Furled. So... While it shares a close genetic similarity with the blood grass, this species has evolved to house its root system in ridge horn-shaped enclosures. All right. Then we have the furled papyrus. The function of the distinctive curled leaves on this aquatic plant is not immediately clear. It is possible that leaves unfurl in low light conditions or that they are designed to channel water currents through the main body of the plant, thus enhancing the nutrient take. So redwort and regress shells. A common plant adaptable to many environments, the redwort is a stable part of the diet of many small herbivores. And then the regress shell. This specimen is composed of a complex series of recessing rings connected by tendrils. Alrighty, we have the cave bush and the jelly shroom. A purple luminescent species which grows well. It grows good against not being near uh, sunlight. And then we have the jelly shroom. This one I actually read when we initially found it. A life form unique to microcosm located in the cave system deep within the grassy plateaus where a high concentration of carnivorous life forms wards off smaller predators. It consists of a small trunk-like base from which it grows. A membrane structure suggests vulnerability to predation, but evidence therefore is lacking. Unknown defensive mechanisms. It literally has a crab snake live in it to attack things. And it definitely has a symbiotic relationship. Membra membrane tree and violet blue. This entity defies neat 
categorization. It consists of more than one coral species working in tandem to create an isolated microcosm enclosed within a translucent membrane found exclusively growing on basalt rock in the Grand Reefs. The homeostatic conditions which are considerably warmer and more dense with micro life then the outside environment and the bright purple fauna inside will likely die off quickly expo exposed and then we have a common luminescent plant which grows in patches on the seabed pretty basic there sea crown and ghost weed ghost weed grows exclusively in deep waters where its pale pigment pigmentation is visible on the fewest wavelengths okay and we have the sea crown which I'm going to move because you can't even read it because of the background. The plant consists primarily of a large bladder-like sac containing a huge variety of bacterial species, which may enable it to break down complex compounds it draws from the root system, shares large sections of the genetic code with a membrane tree. Environment scans indicate the plant is rare to the point of extinction. Well, I'm glad I made more of them threat level. Oh, low. I thought it was, for a second I thought I said the threat level was high. I was like, oh. Uh, blue palm and spotted dock leaf. It's a common aquatic plant which thrives in shallow waters with high exposure to sunlight. Uh, intercepts light before it can reach the smaller flora on the seabed. Uh, I just plant it in like the deepest right recesses of the water so naturally it would die if this wasn't a video game. Uh, spotted dock leaf, a simple aquatic plant. Chemicals within the leaves act to neutralize poisons, acids found in other local specimens, thereby actively encouraging predation by herbivores. This ensures that the plant spreads its seeds but retains enough surface area on its leaves to survive. That's interesting. A lot of these are intentionally getting eaten to spread Rogue Cradle and Eye Stock. A complex cave dwelling flora specimen. The bright yellow core of this plant is protected by a rigid cage, presumably to ward off small or medium sized herbivores. Then the Eye Stock. A cave dwelling tuber dotted with luminescent photosensitive eyes. These eyes may in some way direct the twisted growth of the stems themselves, possibly in reaction to other light sources, proximity of cave walls, or other environmental conditions. And then we have our brain coral, ven veined nettle, and pygmy fan. We will also read this, because I can't plant this. A drooping stinger are the things that poison you when you hit them. Zero photosynthesis the synthetic cells detected implies carnivorous adaptation to low light environments triggering a electromagnetic charge interesting so it when you hit it it zaps you it's kind of like a stingray the pygmy fan a common mildly luminescent plant discovered predominantly in shallow waters. I actually had a hard time finding these. Tree leech, which we don't have. Parasitic fungus-like growth found attached to life forms. An enzyme is released by organisms when dissolves a hole in the skin of the... Ooh. Okay. A common shallow water plant which frequently shows signs of predation around the edges of the leaves, thick violet veins carry nutrients to the extremities of the fan, and brightly colored seeds grow around the base and the stem. And I don't have that. Let's grab some air bubbles here real quick. Why not? We're going to be heading inside anyways, but that's the, the flora garden outside of the aquarium. So we're going to head up and look at the exploitable resources up here. We'll leave this right here for now. So we have acid mushrooms, deep shrooms, blood vine, kelp, 
and jelly sacks. Just so everybody knows. The acid shroom is a common spore-bearing fungi species. The flesh contains a highly acidic compound which leaches into the water if the outer skin is penetrated. It is not clear which predator species necessitated such an extreme countermeasure, but the acid mushrooms name numbers suggest it successfully deterred most of them. It's good for batteries. The root systems generally extend from one cave wall to another, so it grows like right into walls. Where the root system breaks through into open water, its ten tendrils coil around one another for enhanced structural integrity. Cave wall rooting. Where the roots meet the cave wall, it penetrates into a thick, into the rock and continues to grow, albeit at a slower rate. Both blood roots and blood vines produce blood oil. They are pretty much the same species of flora. And we have the blood vine. That's what it, we actually have the blood vine growing here. I'm not sure if you can, if you plant one of these from a blood root, if it actually grows the blood root. I'd actually have to try that. Uh, species of kelp grows in spark. Oh, I thought that said sparse corpses. Deep on the ocean floor and provides shelter from an array of distinct fauna and megafauna. Survival at these depths is challenging, and the life forms which can make their homes have developed unusual coping mechanisms, including a bleaching of skin pigment, dependency on naturally occurring metals and oils to adjust temperature and pressure, in some cases even electrical defense mechanisms. The vibrant red oils which seep from the blood mine coagulate into a semi-hard pustules, which frequently fall loose and form a vital foodstuff for a local ecosystem, or are otherwise reabsorbed into the ground over time so we'll do creep vine next these are inside we'll do those when we get there creep vine a kelp species concentrated in large forests and shallow sandy waters loose root to anchor the plant to the sea from which it steadily grows to the surface in pursuit of sunlight the stem is fibrous and rich in iron making it both viable base material for fabrications and textiles and then we have the creep vine clusters or seeds. Mature creep vine plants that have survived the predation of small herbivores produce these biomolescent seed clusters, which may be knocked loose by current or consumed and later deposited by predators. The embryo is surrounded by thick oil and silicone layer, which would disperse into the ground as the outer skin deteriorated. This may provide the seedlings with nutrients it needs to survive the low light conditions on the seabed. We have deep shrooms, a discolored relative of the acid mushroom adapted to low light conditions, considerably more acidic than its sh okay. shallow dwelling cousin. It may have applications in advanced fabrications. Gel sac. These organic structures grow on cave walls. The purple sacs, which arise from the surface, contain a low density gel laced with spores. These burst from time to time, floating towards the surface and attaching onto the next rock face they encounter. While the jack gel sac is edible, its low density renders it an invaluable advanced construction material. And then these are all... Sulfur plant? Oh, it's from the... Uh, this is from the crash fish. I'll let you guys read that one. We don't have a example of that. We're going to head inside. We have our lantern fruit, our bulbul, and our Chinese potato tree. So we will start with the bulbul tree, a bulb-based flora which roots to the ground and sprouts turquoise leaves. Analysis suggests that sap produced by this plant is poisonous to insects, but can be harvested and consumed by humans for its high water content. So it's poisonous to insects, but not us. The Chinese potato is common throughout the Chine China territories where synthetic foods are still stigmatized and there remain large tracts of arable land on which to grow fresh produce genetically designed prior to the expansion this plant is highly adaptable to different environments and a staple of new colonies galaxy wide so this is a good seed to bring with you apparently we also have the lantern tree which is right here off to our right 
Uh, it's a bunch of different vines which rely on one another to s make structural support. Grows exclusively on fertile land. Each vine produce produces orange lantern shaped fruits with minimal nutrition and hydration value. Edible in an emergency. I, this is one of the main things I eat. Uh, we also have the marble melon. The plant collects water from the air rather than relying on its root systems and produces large fleshy fruits which are both edible and have a typically high water content. Edible, high water content. I like how it says edible in an emergency. That's like one of my favorite ones to eat quick. I usually eat a lot of watermelon, or marble melon, watermelon. So that's, I believe, all the flora. Right, we have the exploitable. Oh, we have the land too. We'll go there first and read the land off. Might as well finish the plant section before we go into all the uh, wonderful fauna. The game actually lags because I have so much stuff. So we have pink cap, a land-based fungus species with harvestable spores. It's inedible. Inedible. We have the fern. The specimen was first identified in an artificial grow bed on the island. It is not listed in existing flora databases, so it's unclear whether or not it is native to this planet. Genetic code shares some features with other local plant life, but this DNA this may be a result of DNA transfusion rather than natural evolution. Interesting. So we don't know if this is actually from this planet. Uh, a hardy specimen which grows on land. The vase-like trunk protects the root system from pre predation and self-repairs over time, explaining the characteristic cracks on the side. So then we have the vo voxel shrub, a pink leaf plant with a angular appearance which ex grows exclusively on land. We also have the speckled rattler over here, the grub basket, and the java cup. A brittle land plant containing large spores which generate a character characteristic rattle when the plant is shaken. Oh, okay, so this may act to ward off predators or even encourage predentation as means of spreading spores. A common land Fungus found in clusters grows quickly, size limited, only by available nutrients and space. An orange colored land plant, which usually contains a thick protein rich sludge at its base, this may suggest a carnivorous life cycle, wherein the grub and insects are attracted to the bright leaves, make their way to the center of the plant, but are unable to scale back up the slick inner leaves and are ultimately digested. So it's like a um, Venus flytrap. That's interesting. But that's our flora, guys. We, we made it through. Uh, we're going to do fauna next. We will actually start with leviathans, because we're already down here. I'm going to probably go backwards, actually. If you watched the episode last time, it takes a second for the photos to actually load in properly, because I have so much stuff going on. We have a sea treader leviathan. Couldn't fit the end. A vast bipedal leviathan which roams the reefs and herds grazing the sea floor. It has antennae on the creature's head can detect range of scents, helping the sea treader to find fresh grazing pastures, avoid the path of large predators, and sense chemical signals from others of their kinds. His thick armor protects the creature from attack by all but the largest carnivores. Two legs extend from the rear. Used to siphon up plant materials from the seafloor and maintain balance. The snout is the has two legs and then a snout. Kind of looks like a tick, honestly. Large herds would decimate the flora of a single er area, thus encouraging the sea treaders' migratory behavior. Families keep their young towards the center of the herd and the parents will lash out at overcurious interlopers in search of an easy meal. Sea treader herds may unearth mineral deposits as they turn up the sands. Then we have the Sea Emperor Leviathan. We have him and his babies in this picture. He 
a juvenile specimen, it is producing a highly potent enzyme which cured us, which could be capable of fully curing individuals of the alien bacterium. Uh, this, species, this species hatches relatively fully formed and independent, perhaps reflecting the fact that they must fend for themselves when they are first born away from their parents. This, this specimen is healthy and exhibiting signs of a positive attitude to life, which is fantastic. I couldn't scan the adult one, and I don't know if I was supposed to be able to, but it didn't let me, just so everybody knows. Uh, next, we have the Sea Dragon Leviathan, which is right here. I have a nice picture of it shooting fireballs at me. Crimson Ray in there. A colossal, colossal leviathan with reptilian features seen stalking the very heart of the volcanic crater which underpins life in this area. This scanned specimen measured one, 112 meters in length. Heat-proof tissue. Oh, interesting. So the outside of its body... Is made to essentially withstand heat. Pretty much shoots fire like a dragon. Uh, it has forearms, are used for both propulsion and offensive purposes. Findings suggest evolutionary divergence from other species on the planet 10 million years ago. The sea dragon is likely one of the oldest species on the planet. Its behavior, as the largest carnivore species encountered on 4546b, Almost everything is potential prey. With few substantial targets in the volcanic cave systems, the sea dragon likely ventures out into cooler waters to hunt other smaller leviathans, corner, cornering them and forcing them deeper, where they are ultimately boiled alive, which we saw with the reaper. Looks like it dragged a reaper down there. The sea dragon's size and the restrictions of cave systems they inhabit suggest their population numbers are extremely low, perhaps in the single digits. While it is not unusual for larger predators to sustain lower populations, it is possible the sea dragon's food sources have diminished over time, and the species may be nearing extinction. Well, that's unfortunate. Reefback Leviathan. The reefback, the vast life form is in excess of 30 millimeters or 30 meters long and has been designated a leviathan class. Fortunately, it feeds exclusively on plankton life forms in the water. It is a hard shell. Most of life forms top side and some of its underside is protected by a thick layered exoskeleton. This suggests an evolutionary path quite different from other organisms. Most of which are vertebrae in nature, the reefback species has likely been able to grow far larger than other herbivores because anything large enough to break through its shell has long gone extinct. So it evolved very well. Uh, similar in appearance to the algae glands of the gasopod, these organs on the reef bag's underside serve some unknown purpose in its digestive system and are capable of expelling small quantities of stomach enzymes into the surrounding water. It has a lo local microcosm on its back. Uh, interesting. Reefback's lifespans likely extend through many centuries should they survive their initial growth cycle for the first few decade decades. Their smaller size would make them vulnerable to carnivorous leviathans. Sociable, seen traveling in small pods and communicating by an echoing call. Behavior is consistent with low-level sentience. Harpers plant small fish in metal-rich barnacles. Next we have our friend the Reaper. This is one of the scariest leviathans to me. There he is trying to eat me. Uh, Leviathan class species are vast organisms at the top of their respective food chains. The species is a streamlined hunter. Yes, it is, with highly developed senses. It has powerful mandibles. This Leviathan is capable of locking its play in place with its four powerful mandibles and drawing it within the center of its jaws. Uh, simulated pressure exceeds Seamoth crush resistance. Yes, it does. It has echolocation, the deep roar emitted by the reaper at regular intervals is effectively sonar. You can hear it. The reaper can see you. Okay. 
scan specimens, measure 55 meters long, observe circling its prey and attacking from behind. This creature is almost all muscle, very little brain, no sense of morality, just muscle, synapses, and teeth. Congratulations on getting close enough to scan it and living to see the results. Motivational note. Uh, extreme threat, avoid in all circumstances. Then we have a ghost leviathan here. Technically, we have a juvenile. I'm going to just read the adult, but I will quickly show you guys the photo. I think it's the same as the, the, the adult. And then we will go to the adult one. Creature is approaching the size limit for sustainable organic life forms and has been designated a Leviathan class. Adults of this species have been encountered exclusively around the edges of the volcanic crater which supports life on this part of the planet and react with extreme aggression on approach. Yes, they do. This thing actually pushed me with its hammerhead during my playthrough, I believe. Like, I thought it was, it was trying to get me, and it hit the exactly my Cyclops where it could not hurt me, but it pushed me and actually gave me a speed boost for, like, quite a bit. Um, anyways... It's part of the creature skull form, a hammerhead which protects the ghost of life and as it performs devastating ramming attacks, which we saw. While fully capable of tearing through the flesh of a creature in range, all evidence indicate that the mature ghost leviathans feed on a microscopic life forms in the water around the edges of the inhabited zone. So they're not attacking out of a predatory purpose, but, the ter but because they're territorial. A creature so vast requires a huge expanse of water to satisfy its daily calorie requirements. Its muscled interior body is surrounded by a translucent outer mem mem membrane suggesting adaptation for deep, low-light environments. When threatened, it can tense its entire body before lashing out with incredible speed. Probably migratory behavior, the specimen was likely born far from the area in which it was encountered. Extreme threat, avoid the crater's edge. So that's our Leviathan. We're going to move on to scavengers, but uh, they're born here, apparently. At least in the game. They're born from this giant tree out here. Those are eggs right there. And then they must... There's a bunch of baby ones in the Lost River, and then there's a few adults on the edge of the, the map. Anyways. So we have shuttle bugs. The image is pretty bad. Let's see if it loads in. There we go a second there. The shuttle bug. A common scavenger at the base of the food chain, small enough to be little threat to most organisms, this creature is clearly adapted to feed on the waste products of the ecosystem around it. Used to orient themselves when drifting and to filter through detritus on the cave floors. I don't think I said that word right. Three legs, high strength muscles can propel the life form great distances through the water, as well as ambulating them across the sea floor. Necessary waste recycler presence may indicate nearby cave systems. Uh, I'll just show you guys the rock grub. We can't get it, and it's so small for me to take a picture it would be like a little green dot on the screen. Um, I did find them in my playthrough during the Mushroom Forest video, so if you want to go see one, it was somewhere in there. And it was very luminescent, I can tell you that. So then we have the larva of the lava larva, which I have a picture of right here in its natural habitat. The lava larva a grub-like species which appears to lack sight and smell but is able to sense and drain thermal and electrical energy in its immediate environment. We saw that on the Cyclops multiple times. Suction cup, capable of attaching to smooth surfaces and generating high pressure suction. Will release if it comes under sufficient strain. Shooting on my Cyclops' shield was strain enough. Uh, torso, thick scales protect from extreme temperatures. The Lava larva lacks a traditional digest digestive system. Instead, it powers its internal processes directly from energy it consumes. Um, it's attracted to energy sources of all kind, draws energy from its prey to survive. Avoid when piloting vehicles. Remove to conserve batteries. 
Now, I wonder if I had built a base, if it would attach to a base. I might do that just to see if they do, because I'm actually intrigued by that. Floaters, which are these things right here, these pink things. Nice little teeth on them. Two species of living in symbio symbiosis, which attach to and attempt to feed on any object they come in contact with. Dominant life form. The pink main body and inner suction jaw is the dominant creature. Once attached to an organism or other stable stable surface, it will attempt to leach nutrients in order to grow. The outer gel like substance is a mesh of microorganisms capable of forming a sealed vacuum around the creature's jaws. A thin layer of helium is stored within the outer membrane, providing buoyancy to the floater and anything it is attached to may aid in flotation of sunken objects. Interesting. So then we have the cave crawler, which is next. I have a picture of a bunch of them here. That one was trying to get me. We have a couple on the wall. An agile territorial carrion feeder, well adapted to both land and sea. Gas exchange membrane absorbs essential gases from the air or water for basic body of bodily regulation mandibles the species seeks out corpses in packs before defending its claim while the corpse is devoured necessary waste recycler avoid or incapacitate and then we have its cousin the blood crawler An agile territory scavenger that moves and packs across the seabed, closely related to its amphibious cave crawler, but adapted to deep sea conditions. The greatest difference between the crawlers are the four legs, which extend more than a meter from the blood crawler's torso, allowing it to move at a surprisingly fast speed across seabeds and even to scale walls. The blood crawler can lower its entire body to bring its mandibles within grasping distance of the carrion on which it feeds while retaining maneuverability it requires to avoid predators. Next we have bleeders, which we found on the aura and near life pod 19, which is where the picture is. You can see one in the picture right here. It's actually hard to make out because it's so small. Um, a simple parasitic organism, a little more complex than a common space tick, but just as dirty. Used for collection and digestion of blood drawn from host creatures, its jaws, rows of teeth, and mandibles used to attach to the skin. Its behavior, the bleeder's low speed and poor def defenses suggest they evolved primarily as carrion feeders, but they are also prone to target larger living creatures which are less likely to notice and take action against them. And yes, they are inconvenient. We also saw these. These are right outside my base. They are non-sentient organisms found in it, attached to land with high levels of fossilized organic matter. So that's why you find a lot in the Lost River. So then we have our herbivores. Uh, we have the ghost ray first. The ray species has adapted to deep sea conditions. Its body is fully protected by translucent skin and its large wings are capable of generating considerous thrust. Uh, considerable thrust. As it is common for the rays on this planet, the ghost ray's flesh is ineditable, making it one of the more resilient herbivores. Feeds on plant matter that has settled on the ground in deep caverns. We have the crimson ray. One of the largest rays on the planet, displaying generally docile behavior. Thick scalings. Scales formed on the skin protect this ray from extreme temperatures, allowing it to survive the areas unpopulated by competing scavengers. Forward mounted eye sockets. Forward mounted eye sockets suggest a predatory evolutionary history left behind long ago. So they used to be predators. We have the warper here, which I think is under carnivores. An aggressive creature with the ability to teleport itself to other spaces, no genetic crossovers, crossovers identified with the indigenous life forms, and it doesn't have any recognized defensive behavior. Um, this is we 
found other data on this in the actual playthrough where it is made. It is not an actual creature from this planet. It's extremely uh, dangerous if you're infected, but not dangerous if you're not. We have the river prowlers, which are these things, a couple in the background. A fast, agile predator discovered at great depths. Powerful jaws used for both savaging prey and warding off larger predators. Its eel-like torso is highly vulnerable, consisting pre pre predominantly of spinal columns and cartilage. It shows significant overlap with other eel-like predators on this planet. It will aggressively keep its jaws facing its opponents, but smaller, faster life forms may have the advantage. We have the blighter, which are these guys. Small predator that shares close resemblance to the more common biter, but tends towards a more solitary, less aggressive hunting style. Which is funny because my picture has three of them, and when I do the biter next, you'll see I could only find one. Um, while the red-tipped protrusion on the blight blighter's head once served as a sensory apparatus, it has adapted to not to chase but to coax its prey into its path. As prey creatures are attracted to the dancing of the stalk, the blighter can dart forward to catch and consume them. Teeth. One row of sharp, piercing teeth is all the blighter needs to tear through its prey. This creature has found little use for eyes in the depths, and its eyeballs are likely sensitive to nothing more than broad fluctuations in local light sources. So pretty much when it sees something, it says food. Next we have the biter. It's a vicious pack hunting predator, which is mostly muscle, and then everything else. Indiscriminate, indiscriminate when hungry. Almost always hungry. Uh, employed in detection of bodily fluids in water and impressive range, secondary pair of eyes likely dedicated to detecting the peripheral movement of larger predators and hungry members of its own species. Overdeveloped tail fin. Favors outpacing and outnumbering their prey over individual maneuverability. Calculations suggest creatures up to 100 times the biter's body weight could succumb to a focused assault by a pack of 10. That's pretty crazy. Avoid packs, try not to bleed. Saying they're attracted by blood. Alrighty. So then we have lava lizards here. I think we're going to do this in two parts though. I think we're going to end here and do the tanks in the next video. Anyways, I appreciate you guys joining me for the aquarium tour. And now we're going to actually start on the actual aquarium. Alright, I'll see you guys next time. Mystic Games out. And I'll see you...